Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. And by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code ham nation when you check out. This is Ham Nation, episode number 187 for March 11th, 2015. Green hams and gear. Good evening, everybody. It's time for Ham Nation. And this is Bob Heil, K9EID, coming to you from the Ozarks tonight, where uh, uh, I, I guess the bands are okay. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Man, oh man, it went nuts today. But we have... Uh, have some of our folks here and some of our folks are not uh, but we've got Gordo with us down in uh, good old California Gordon how are you tonight I am fine although the bands are not after the big eruption today but let me tell you everybody's getting ready Bob for this weekend Midland Texas having their St. Patty's Ham Fest on Saturday the 14th and then you, Bob, are going to Green Country Ham Fest in Claremore, Oklahoma, at their Expo Center. And that's a Friday night, all day Saturday. And then our own Randy is going up to the Sierra Foothills Amateur Radio Club, their first ham fest near Sacramento, California. I'll be going to Palm Springs, a ham fest put on by Desert Rats. Um, and um, this weekend at Plano Ham Radio Outlet. It's Chris Wilson and Dennis representing Yezu and Karen and Rod with RT Systems. And finally, uh, the Wheaton Community Radio Amateurs are putting on a class this Saturday, Bob, and next Saturday. And I get to be in on their class via Skype. So it's a full weekend for all of us with Ham Nation. Bob, back to you. Busy time. I uh, Friday... I uh, play a theater organ concert in Tulsa, just down the road from Claremore, for their uh, their theater organ club. And, of course, I enjoy doing that very much, so we'll be there. But we're going to also go down and see what's happening with Don. Don, how are you doing? It's been a little bit crazy, hectic day, right? It has. We It's been raining pretty much all week. I had a horrible head cold on Monday. I, I had a full day yesterday. Today I sat in traffic for two and a half hours trying to get home and just literally got home about about 15, 20 minutes ago. So, yeah, it's been nuts. And speaking of nuts, what Gordon was talking about is there was one confirmed, possibly two X-class solar flares today. X2.1 was one of them. Uh, we've got the solar update coming up with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Of course, that was recorded before this happened today. But uh, if you follow her at Tamitha Scove on Twitter, she'll keep you up to date on all of the solar weather happenings. And uh, actually, uh, a ham, KC7 uh, RUN, uh, was on 40 when it happened, and he actually um, heard it suck all of 40 meters away, and he has audio of that, and I did not have time to prepare that uh, for us tonight, uh, being the time that I got. But uh, nonetheless, it was uh, pretty amazing to have two of those things within about 20 or 30 minutes of each other. And um, yeah, no ham fest for me this weekend, but I'm hoping to make my first car show over the year uh, this weekend. And now next weekend on the 20th and 21st, is the Rain Louisiana Ham Fest. That's down yeah. in Cajun country in Lafayette. And they're famous for having their Friday night fey-do-do and crawfish boil. I've never, <laughs> made, I've never made the crawfish boil because I have to work on Fridays, and it's about a three-hour drive, but I'm planning on making it uh, Saturday the 21st. So, yeah, it's uh, I'm getting ready for a, a couple of big weekends here, guys. Well, uh, 
uh, next week you bring us some video about uh, uh, 40 meters being dead. And maybe next week you will be Don uh, uh, <laughs> Will Banks instead of George Thomas. Brian put up the wrong uh, Chiron. So you're not George. And unfortunately, oh, well. George is not with us tonight. Uh, he's uh, He had a couple little things go on this week. And uh, so he's not here. But that uh, let's see, Don, is that still you? <laughs> let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Go back to I, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. No. I've been called worse, but not by better. So, you know, that's all right if Brian makes that mistake. My bad. I've, I've been called worse just here at home earlier today. So, it's all Listen, good. Anybody, anybody can call me George Thomas any day. He's a fantastic yes, person. and. I admire him, so we're we're glad that uh, he's with us all. But sorry, he's not here tonight. Hope he's getting along okay. I got a couple of things. I, I've been meaning to mention this every every Wednesday. I get this notice from a very reputable ham fester, uh, a very reputable uh, a chat room. Uh, technologist and that's dave nt9e he sends this really great poster around uh, about hey it's uh, uh it's ham nation time and it's really great dave i have to try to get one of those up and we'll show it at what he does and he reminds everybody to turn on your roku and call your grandmother and <laughs> Uh, you get your computers. It's really cool. I appreciate that very much. And uh, I just got off the phone with John. I bet a lot of you've heard or worked him uh, from uh, from Bogota, Colombia, HK3C. Incredible signal all the time. And uh, I have to say proudly that he's been a, a user of our, our stuff for years and uh, kind of looking around for stuff and he didn't didn't find anything better well he's got a new pro 7 and he was just going crazy today so we appreciate john uh, uh giving us a great report we're going to have him on the show sometime he's an incredible guy he's got a great history so hk3c and i'm sure a lot of you've heard him or worked him especially on 17 and uh, one other thing uh the you know we had the american legion guys on uh, um, last month, and uh, it's now the 96th birthday of uh, the Le American Legion, and uh, their radio station, K9TAL, uh, they're going to have a special event this Saturday, March 14th, and uh, you, you guys and gals, you want to try to find them. Uh, you can um, oh, look around uh, where they got 14275, and you'll find them there. Or, uh, they're on two meters also in the Indianapolis area. But, of course, we're very proud of what uh, K9 TAL and, and that whole group has done uh, to keep uh, the American Legion alive. So that, that's, that's really, really super stuff. Um, I've had several emails. I even had a phone call this week, and it was tough to find me as we were moving around like nuts, about balance. And I want to do just a couple of minutes here about balance. It, it's really um, a toughie because here's the deal. Guys are putting up dipoles. We know what a dipole is. Two wires. Bring it into a coax, shield goes to one side, positive goes to the other. No. You might want to do that, and it might work, and it will work, but half of your signal is on that shield, and it comes right back down into your station, into the grounds, and you know about the ground system, but you really need a transformer up there where the two leads come together and meet with your coax. It's very, very simple. And uh, they're little guys that look like this. And you can get them. Just about every dealer has them. Here's a Jetstream. DX Engineering's got a really nice one they build. But what you want to do is couple your one side of your dipole here, the other side here. This is to hang it. And your coax is here. And what happens inside this magic little box is a transformer. And this is what it looks like. And this way, the 
outside shield of that coax does not touch the antenna. It's transformed. It's conducted through a transformer. We have a balanced antenna and an unbalanced line, and that's a one-to-one -one balance. And, and you really want to pay attention to that. Uh, I, I've, I've helped a lot of guys solve their RFI problems by putting a ballon up at their dipole and get rid of that RF on the, on the shield of the feed line. And it's just a, a real simple little thing. But we're starting to get into that season. I was out looking around a while ago and... Um, Dave and Jenna at IAC, they sent me another 75-meter coaxial dipole. And uh, I, I'm, I'm going to put that one up out here. And I'm going to do that one uh, east and west. So I have a little bit of pattern north and south. Just experimenting. But uh, nor nice warm weather this, this week. And so supposed to be this way for another week or two. So we're probably out of winter here in the Midwest. We sure hope so. But anyway, I just wanted to mention this, this little subject of balance. And it's not, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. It's not a balum. I hear that on the radio. I want to come through the speaker. <laughs> it's a balun. It's balanced, B-A-L, right? Take the first three letters of balanced and unbalanced. Un, U-N, not U-M. You spell unbalanced with an N. And you take the first three letters of bal and the first two letters of unbalanced. And what do you have? Bal, un. It's just one of my pet peeves. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, Gordo, I... Uh, I, I stepped over you there because you didn't do your short shots, but I, I got to rolling on this balum thing. I bet you agree, don't you? <laughs> um, I, I do, Bob. In fact, uh, I have a picture of a balloon. Oh, oh excuse me, a balum. Excuse me, a balloon. And uh, run the wire through the eyes, but don't forget you attach the wire just below the eyes at the attachment point. So there we go, Bob. You're right about that. Yeah. Hey, we saw a lot of balance, uh, and uh, Bob, it's a great subject that you brought up. And uh, if we could go ahead and roll the short shots. Oh, by the way, over my shoulder is the amateur television network, ATN, and that's their picture from their tower high atop a local uh, peak here in Southern California. So let me know if you see it moving around. That means the wind is ready to blow. All right, uh, Brian, let's go to the short shots. And here we are at Main Trading Company in Paris, Texas. And uh, we visited them uh, and uh, their setup run by Richard, Christie, and Tammy is interesting because as a smaller operation, yeah, I'm actually holding snow of all things. They have at Main Trading used gear that they trade in, financing, layaway, extended warranty, They've got plenty of stuff, and they do 27 shows a year. Well, this is our big Saturday at Ham Radio Outlet, Plano, Texas. And the neat thing about the store is everything is live. And that means that customers can come in. Their grand opening uh, started uh, a week ago with Ray at ICOM there. Uh, today we had uh, last Saturday Phil with Kenwood, and next week it's Chris and Dennis with Yesu. But the neat thing about it is everything is live, and they've got antenna switches that uh, dial into uh, you name it, and they've got it uh, turned on thanks to Steve Gilmore, W4SHG, that went up there and put all the antennas on the roof. And the neat thing is you could select between Kenwood, Yezu, Icom, and Alinko radios, click, click, click with their band switching, and really hear these radios on the air and all of their stores. And they've got 13 ham radio outlet stores uh, have this live capability. And uh, because I've got a 990 here, Bob, I was able to pretty well get around with a 990 there. And while it's got a ton of buttons, let me tell you, the band conditions were hot that day. And uh, we even had an HRO pooch, uh, a mascot and... Um, uh, they were uh, parading around and greeting all the customers for the grand opening, the uh, second week of grand opening. And the store was jammed. Hundreds of hams poured in from as far as four states away. 
And uh, that is Steve Gilmore, W4SHG, the national sales manager for the ham radio outlet chain. And let me tell you, their store was standing tall. And yes, it was a Saturday. We had a lot of kids, KG5CXE, on the air. And uh, just uh, everybody gave this young man a great uh, deal of applause for doing uh, so well with his ham radio. So we applaud those stores that are making ham radio happen. And certainly the HRO chain is uh, one of them, DX Engineering, another great group. They bring ham radio to you or you get to see some of their store operations. And that's neat because all of them have live gear turned on so you can actually turn the dials. That's a neat thing, not just a brown box, but live gear to play with first. So that was our tour this uh, w uh, past weekend, Ham Radio Outlet, as well as uh, Main Trading Company. And uh, they're going to have a big open house for three more weeks on Saturday. So for those of you near Plano, get on down there and enjoy the festivities at HRO Plano, Texas. Bob, back to you and your balloon. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry I couldn't <laughs> make it, but... Two weeks in a row, DFW, the great airport of Dallas, was closed. Yeah. Can you believe that? It was iced up and closed, so I couldn't get there. So really hated that because I was all ready to go. But we're, uh, we're going to turn around and try to make it to Oklahoma this week, and I know we will because I'm driving. And, Don, you really have a lot of news here uh, about this solar uh, thing going on, and then, of course, uh, wonderful news line and when you uh, finish we want to talk to you talk to you and gordo we're going to talk about the founder of news line but in the meantime let's hear a little bit of news from you don from amateur radio news line report number 1955 these are the ham nation headlines for wednesday march 11th 2015 Ham Radio was the hero after a road crash rescue saturday morning february 21st on an arkansas highway just south of the missouri line Jim Wong, N5CXP, lives in Baxter County, Arkansas. He has set out for the town of Mountain Home to get the truck he drives on weekends for Magnus Oil. But the roads were treacherously slick with ice, so he stopped on a hilltop where he had a cell phone signal and called the dispatcher to say he wasn't going to make it in. The dispatcher agreed, so Wong turned around and was headed back home. That's when he came upon a car on the side at the bottom of the hill up against the guardrail. The driver, Ashley Miller, was also on her way to work when she hit a patch of black ice and felt the car spin out of control. She told the local newspaper that she had blood coming out of her head but heard someone coming, so she honked her car horn. Long heard the honking horn and a woman crying inside, and 5CXP tried to open the door, but it was jammed. Then he had Miller try the car's moonroof that opened enough so that he could pry it the rest of the way. Miller said that he came through the roof, cut her seatbelt off, then he helped pull her out and took Miller to his truck where he wrapped her in a blanket to keep her warm. The crash happened at a low point on the highway near the bottom of a creek where there wasn't any cellular service. So N5CXP used his 2B the transceiver to contact N9JSM via the Mountain Home repeater who called the local 911 emergency response number and reported the accident. Soon, a first responder from the Clark Ridge Fire Department arrived, followed by a Baxter County Sheriff's deputy and an ambulance. Miller was taken to Baxter Regional Medical Center in Mountain Home where she was treated and then released. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF in Los Angeles. Another example of ham radio coming through when all other lines of communications fail. You may recall a few weeks ago in Ham Nation episode number 182, we featured the American Legion Amateur Radio Club. Ralph Squalacci, KK6ITB, tells us of more press for K9TAL. This March edition of the American Legion magazine has a two-and-a-half-page article on ham radio and another one-page article entitled The American Legion and Ham Radio. The American Legion Amateur Radio Club is open to wartime military veterans who are both members of the Legion family and FCC-licensed amateur radio operators. More information and links to the article are at www.legion.org forward slash ham radio. Membership is open to both American Legion members and sons of the American Legion who are also licensed ham radio operators. If you've ever wanted to participate in the World Radio Team Sport Championships but just can't make the trip, you can now experience it vicariously through the magic of video.
James Brooks, 9V1YC, has made available a video about the Amateur Radio World Radio Sport Team Championship 2014. The World Radio Sport Team Championship, better known as WRTC, is a competition between two-person teams of amateur radio operators testing their skills to make contacts with other radio amateurs around the world over a 24-hour period. Unlike most on-the-air competitions, all stations are required to use identical antennas from the same geographic region, eliminating all variables except operating ability. You'll find the link to this stunning hour-long HD video in the full edition of this week's Amateur Radio Newsline Report. And if you're planning on attending the International DX Convention but have not registered yet, advanced registration ends April 4th. This year's program includes DX University and Contest Academy sessions, ARRL, DX and Contest forums, and a long list of DX and technical presentations, as well as an entire exhibition hall of displays and vendors. Gene Socrates, KC2IOV, will keynote the Saturday banquet. Socrates holds the Guinness World Record as the oldest woman to sail solo and nonstop around the world. The Sunday DX Convention Breakfast speaker will be Bob Alphen, K4UEE, who will talk on the recent K1N de-expedition to Navassa Island. Alfred also is scheduled to speak at the Friday Top Band Dinner about the team's 160-meter experiences. This year's 66th Annual International DX Convention is being sponsored by the Northern California DX Club. It will take place April 16th to the 19th at the Visalia Convention Center in Visalia, California. For the Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jerry Goodrich, KF5KRN in Topeka, Kansas. More information is available on the convention website. You'll find that at www.dxconvention.com. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for over 37 years and counting at www.arnewsline.org. For Bill Pasternak, WA6ITF, Ralph Squalacci, KK6ITB, and Jerry Goodrich, KF5KRN, I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. And now here's your solar update with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Hi, I'm Tam with the Scove with your solar storm forecast for the week of March 10th. All eyes are on region 2297 this week, and here's why. This thing was announcing itself before it even became visible on the east limb. It fired off an M-class flare back on the 6th and let off a solar storm as well, and since then it's just been sputtering and kicking off more flares. It's a highly unstable region. Part of that is because of this hot ribbon. Do you see this big hot ribbon of plasma here? This is the remnant scar of that monstrous filament that originally erupted back on the backside, and it's destabilized the whole area. Meanwhile, region 2297 lets off an M-class flare. This is an M92 you can see here, and then it's, since then it's let off an M4.5 flare and a high C-class flare. So they just keep coming, and we're expecting more. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the next few days, we are still feeling the effects of a high-speed stream, but it is waning. NOAA is giving us about a 25% chance of a major storm at high latitudes on the 10th. Now, if you couple that with the possibility of a grazing passage from that solar storm that's planning on passing us to the east, we might see storming that continues into Wednesday and Thursday before things begin to settle down. At mid-latitudes, expect only about a 15% chance of active conditions uh, in through Thursday before things settle down. Now we did have that M5.8 flare just moments ago and with that is an associated solar storm. It's hard to tell if it's earth directed yet. We need to wait for coronagraphs, images and models to give us more information. But if it is earth directed then we might see an uptick in activity around the 14th uh, if that thing begins to uh, impact earth. Now during that M5.8 flare that we just had moments ago, a good colleague of mine, Land Lamp Fear, who's an amateur radio operator, KC7 and run was on the airwaves with me and we were doing some tests to see what kind of noise floor and how bad the static got on the bands during that flare. And I just wanted to say thank you for all of the people who reported in, giving him information about what your noise level was and, and uh, helping us out for this particular test. And I especially wanted to say thanks to N5SDO, that's Dave in New Mexico, and N5DAR, uh, that's Mike, for making me feel very, very welcome on the bands this morning. I really appreciated it. So this week is very exciting. Although we only have one active region in Earth view right now, it is an X-Flare contender. So expect to have intermittent issues with your GPS, your satellite phone and satellite internet, and you ham radio operators. Expect possible blackouts during these very large flares. So it looks like to be an exciting week, and stay tuned. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. 
And yes, that X flare did pop today. You should follow her on Twitter. If you don't, uh, you really should at uh, Dr. Tamitha at Tamitha Scove. She uh, she posted uh, a graph showing about where this this big thing what it would affect. And you can take a look here and see that pretty wow. big uh, pretty big area of effect for that uh, for that X uh, X flare today. So wow, uh, wow, between wow. between her and Land KC seven R U N and a whole bunch of other hams. Uh, they're keeping their eyes on it, and uh, like I said, I've got some audio of that thing. I'll try to have that for you next week. So, and there are also links where you can go and listen to it yourself uh, if you follow her on Twitter at Tamitha Scove. Now, before we get into DX Engineering, I've got some news about the prodigal ham. That, of course, being Bill Pasternak, WA6 ITF. Uh, you know, he's been in the hospital for months and months and months and months and months and months and months. And months it seems like some good news. He's going home Friday. All so, right. Uh, isn't that cool? Right. It was announced today. But uh, Brian, put right. the slide up if you if you want to uh, if you want to uh, send Bill some 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 well wishes. Here is how you do it. You can look us up on our Facebook page, Amateur Radio Newsline, or uh, you can email the regular Newsline uh, email address to newsline at arnewsline.org, and you can uh, wish him a welcome home, uh, get well soon. Uh, you can call him names. Uh, you can call him George. She doesn't have to call him. No, you can't. Anyway, uh, send, him a, send him a quick email. He would love love that. And, of course, if you're not a member of the Amateur Radio Newsline Facebook family, why aren't you? Something wrong with you. They don't want you in the house. So rectify Oh, that. wow. So that, there you go. So, yeah, super. Bill's going home. He's going home. So. Oh, that is just terrific so that uh, yep. Bill Pasternak is uh, going home. And, mm -hmm. Don, uh, this weekend in Palm Springs, where Bill's been to a lot of ham fests in Palm Springs, we're going to start around a card saying, it's about time you uh, got out. And everyone, if you get a chance, as Don indicated, uh, not George, but Don, uh, send yeah. Bill a uh, glad you're out. And Bill will uh, well represent you this weekend, this Saturday in Palm Springs at the Ham Fest. Yeah, and he's probably in the chat room right now. He hangs out in the chat room quite a bit. All right, we were talking about balance earlier, and here it is, that page 82 on the DX Engineering catalog and my, my light kind of blows it out but anyway nonetheless they've got a bunch of balance on page 82 and 83 of the dx engineering catalog but you know what they do not have in the dx engineering catalog i'll tell you what they don't have what's that they don't have the newest addition to the dx engineering family and that is alenko that's the big news tonight from dx engineering they are proud to announce they now carry alenko now wow for deck for deck yeah it's a big deal for decades alenko's been making great radios that are Feature packed and high performance radios you don't often see at budget friendly prices, and that's been the big thing with Alenco. Is uh, man, you can get into Alenco for uh, not a whole lot of money, and it's a good radio. Well, you can now get your Alenco radios and accessories coupled with DX Engineering's excellent customer support and amazingly fast shipping. Just incredible stuff. This is this is big news. They have handhelds. They have base and mobile radios. It's an excellent blend of performance, value, and ease of use. I have an Alenco uh, 220 HT that that I that I really like. It's a nice nice radio. They're they're great options for hams of any age and skill level. Here are just some of the radios that they make, and you'll find the entire line at dxengineering.com. The DX SR8T is an HF station. Great great radio, 160 to 10 meters, including the 60 meter bands. It has extended receive from 130 to uh, 130 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, 100 watts of power on single sideband CW and FM, 40 uh, watts for AM. QRPers, you're going to like this, especially even if you go out and maybe you do some uh, some on scene stuff. Battery power, they have both low and super low settings, so that's a neat thing. Uh, also, the DX SR9T hybrid version of that radio is available. That adds a software defined counterpart. Then there's the DJ500T. That is a VHF UHF handheld. It's rugged, it's reliable. Two meter, 70 centimeter, crammed with features, but it's still easy to use. It has full semi duplex operation across both bands. That could be handy for satellite work. DJ500T features multiple scanning modes and a large LCD screen. Uh, Alenco also has free downloadable software that makes programming and cloning a breeze. Looking for a dual band mobile VHF UHF? Check out the DR635TV. 50 watts of power available in three power levels. Built-in duplexer makes mobile installation clean and simple. You can add digital voice capabilities with an optional digital unit as well. So spread the word. Alenco, 
is now part of the DX Engineering family, and we could not be happier. That also means you can get all of the Elenco accessories and upgrade parts to keep your radio operating at its absolute highest potential. DX Engineering, the fastest shipping in the industry. You get your order in by 10 o'clock tonight, Eastern. If it's in stock, it'll be on a truck headed your way tonight. Proven products, expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog or shop online 24-7 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. DX Engineering and the Linko, a marriage made in ham heaven. And thank you so much for your support of Ham Nation tonight. Now, let's, uh, let's go to the smoke and solder segment tonight. I'll be George. I'll have to talk <laughs> real slow, but I'll be George. But let's let's uh, let's let's uh, let's go check in with. <laughs> He's gonna kick my butt. Let's go check in now with Randy and talk about antenna testing on smoke and solder. Hi, Randy K7AGE. I'm outside with my Super Antenna MP1 portable vertical antenna, and I'm going to use Whisper software to do some antenna checks to see how well the, my signal is being received. I'm going to run three checks, one during the mid-afternoon here in California, one during the gray line, and another check this evening. They're all going to be for, for about one hour. And what the Whisper software does is sends out a signal, and people can receive it and post the results to the net. Let's quickly look at this in operation. This is the Whisper software. My radio is currently in receive. goes into a nearly two-minute transmit cycle. Listen to the tone carefully. At the end of two minutes, the station send their reception reports to whispernet.org, where you can do an update on the map and see the stations that have received your signal. Isn't this neat? Let's go back to the portable antenna. The super antenna is made up of several pieces. There's an adjustable coil that slides up and down. There's a whip up on the top. It also has uh, four ground radios pulled out here on the patio. For my radio equipment, I'm going to use my FT817 running at 5 watts and my little Asus T100 uh, laptop netbook. So I'm not going to tell you about Whisper. I'm going to let Joe Taylor, K1JT, the author, developer, and our Nobel laureate, tell you about it. He spoke about this at the ARRL Centennial. Whisper stands for the Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. Uh, it's a uh, sort of quasi-beacon mode, transmits but doesn't conduct two-way conversations. It makes a transmission that lasts for two minutes, starting at the top of a, of a UTC minute. You've got to have your computer clock synchronized to UTC. Typically, uh, people will set their, their whisper system up so that it transmits about uh, maybe 20% of the time and receives 80% of the time. The messages are always uh, very simple and straightforward. It, it includes your call sign, your grid locator, a four-digit locator, and then a two-digit number which gives the power level at which you're transmitting in dB above one milliwatt. Whisper is a very efficient mode as far as uh, spectrum usage is concerned, and the tiny little slice of spectrum on each band that is devoted to whispering is only 200 hertz wide. Uh, but in that 200 hertz, uh, you can get a dozen or more signals uh, and decode them all. Uh, that, uh, except maybe if a couple of them land on top of each other, but that won't happen the next time they transmit, probably. And uh, the signals are only about six hertz wide, each one. So they're very small uh, in frequency space, and, uh, and you can get a lot of them into a small space. Uh, if, you are, if your computer that is running Whisper is connected to the Internet, you can tick a box on the screen so that uh, all of your reception reports will be uploaded to a central database that's run by W1BW up here in New England somewhere, and uh, the whispernet.org site uh, will display them on a world map. Okay, that was a nice description of Whisper from Joe. Let's take a look at his website to find out where to find the software in the user manual and to be able to download it. I'm not going to show you all the steps of how to do all this. It's fairly well detailed in the, in the user guide. So this is the Whisper web page. And we scroll down here a little bit, you'll see Whisper 2.0 and 2.1. 2.0 is what I've been using, and that will work for 99% of the users. Scroll down the page, and you can see the downloads for Whisper 2.0 for Windows and Linux. And documentation, you can see Whisper 2.0 uh, user's guide. So you want to get the software and get the user's guide. This is what the user's guide looks like. So I'm going to let you look at those details. Okay, let's look at some of the setup parameters to set up Whisper. 
They're under the setup menu, station parameters. The first field is your call sign. The next one's your grid. I'll show you a web page here in a second that sets that. The next two have to deal with your audio in and out. And I'm using a signal link USB, so that's the USB codec. The power level, and if you just hold your mouse over that, you can see it shows me 5 watts at 37. I'm using Vox for the push to talk because the signal link has a Vox built in. I'm running my system manually, so I'm going to select 20 meters. In the frequency area here, there's a dial and a transmit frequency shown. So the dial is what you tune your radio to for a whisper on 20 meters, 14.0956 in upper sideband. The transmit frequency you can control within the waterfall here. Now we don't see anything at the moment, but if I double click on a spot on the display there, it says it will set the transmit frequency to that and you can see the little cursor has moved. Whisper also requires that your clock to be set properly. Let's let's chuck my clock here against WWV. That's good. Okay, we're coming to the end of a uh, two minute sequence here. You can see when it's receiving, all you see is the uh, box here that says receiving. There's no live waterfall. So when the um, transmit sequence ends, which is going to be in just a couple seconds, bang, waiting to start, decoding, it drew in the past two minutes worth of waterfall. I'm still decoding. And I decoded one signal, KD6RF in EM22. He's running five watts and he was a minus 13 dB signal level. This is the WhisperNet web page. shows a map and I have it filtered now for only the stations that I was hearing or was hearing me, but I'm only in the receive mode. I'm not transmitting here. Here's a neat web page I found that shows grid squares. When you're at this zoom level, it shows you the first two letters, the major part of the grid. So I know I am in Charlie Mike 99 and KD. And I can hit show. So zoom that in. And this is the area that I live in. And if I go to Whisper here, let's pick out a station. Um, K4RCG FM08. So if I put FM08 in there and hit show, it now shows the path between me and his station or his grid and it tells me it's 2,249 miles. That's pretty neat. So there quickly is kind of how Whisper works, but remember that I started this whole thing in the beginning of the video to see how my FT817 running five watts to the adjustable vertical antenna did. Let's take a look. So this is at just about 000 UTC my time, which would still be in the afternoon. You can see I was, uh, seeing uh, stations from the basically from the mid to the east side of the United States and this one station up in Greenland during the gray line time so again the eastern side of the United States down into Central America as well as out into the Pacific Australia and New Zealand in this E50W station and the next plot is during my nighttime, so at 0530 UTC, you can see I'm still seeing, or stations still on the East Coast are receiving me, as well as this K4EH in Greenland, if that's real, and uh, again, several in Australia and a couple in New Zealand, as well as one station in Japan copied my signal. So I think the FT817 and that vertical antenna worked pretty well and that's what the whole idea of all this was to use whisper to to check out your antenna to see what it's doing or check propagation put a signal out it runs the other stations receiving whisper signals automatically send that up to the website where you can go and go and look pretty neat way to take a look at things this is randy k7age thanks for watching Awesome stuff, Randy. Very nice. I got to check that Whisper stuff out. But first, let's check out ICOM.
From new models to classic radios, there's something for everyone this season. So get out or hunker down with ICOM. Celebrate ICOM's 50th year with the IC7850. Only 150 units are available, and each radio features 1.2 kilohertz optimized roofing filter, a new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and distinct gold accents on the front panel and commemorative label. For contesters just starting out this year, ICOM's IC7600. You get advanced DSP technology and IF roofing filters, dual watch on the same band on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display. Got cabin fever and need to get away? Get mobile with ICOM's IC2730A and ID5100A. The analog 2730A mobile and digital 5100A with built-in GPS. Both feature optional Bluetooth capability for hands-free operation, 50 watts output power on both VHF and UHF, and the large backlit screen. For entry-level D-Star operation, take the ID888H on the road. Features include a good menu structure and VHF-UHF dual-band functionality, one band at a time. To hunker down or get out, the ID51A Plus is a perfect radio to enjoy global communications. This dual bander has the free downloadable RSMS1A Android app, enhanced DV functionality, and additional D-plus reflector link commands. Make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's base stations, mobiles, and portables. Yeah, and make sure you visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation and register for the monthly prize. In addition, you can also go there and check out all the swag and whatnot. Uh, you could be the monthly grand prize winner. The, the prize for March is going to be that great IC2730A analog dual band mobile that George talked about. So get on there, icomamerica.com slash hamnation and be part of something greater than all of us or something like that. Let's take a look now at a brand new segment. It's it's Christian K0STH and the new ham segment. And tonight, Christian is going to introduce us to a new ham from the Pacific Northwest. Well, welcome, Mike. You're the first new ham on this segment, and I appreciate your Thank time you. today. This is Mike Grace, KG7KDD. That's a cool call, man. Let's let's get into your uh, your history with ham radio. Where did you find it? So uh, it started with uh, my dad and I. We were getting into firearms and prepping and watching YouTube videos all over the place. And a lot of people were talking about, you know, you got to be prepared with communication. So um, my dad knew about uh, a local church group that was teaching for the technician license test. So he said, hey, we got to go and take this test and study for it. So we started studying and we went and passed. That's where it all started. So you're thinking more along the lines, at least originally, about emergency communications. Is that really the... That's that's kind of how we started looking into it. I mean, I, I got interested and kind of learned about ham radio back when I was a kid watching movies with my dad. You know, there was a submarine that was sinking and the guys were stuck in one part of the ship and they had to talk to the other part of the ship, but communications were down, so they wrapped out the message in Morse code and started learning a little bit about uh, ham radio and Morse code stuff that way. But yeah, that's kind of how we got into actually testing and getting into getting some equipment. Have you heard in the community, I mean, the hams, there's over 700,000 of us now and a lot of old school guys. I mean, you know, we're working with them here on Ham Nation. And although they've never given me any trouble per se about being a non-code ham, have you run into that now see i'm interested in learning code and i'll get to it i know i will but have you had any any cases where any maybe elmers said to you ah you're a no code ham <laughs> no i haven't had any problems in fact one of the things that i've really loved about getting into ham radio is how welcoming and helpful people are that i've met and started communicating with and you know i've got a friend that lives here close by john uh, ND7i. He's got an antenna tuner and he's helped me build some antennas and answered questions about equipment and I contact people on the air on two meters and you know it's it's just amazing how welcoming and friendly everybody is. Now as a fellow new ham you know isn't it exciting it's, it must be I haven't built my own antenna now I've put one up but I haven't built my own and there's something about hearing your calls come back to you uh, Tell me about that experience, maybe your first contact on your first antenna build. Um, so 
again, it, it has to do with my dad. I built, uh, I was, what, what I was trying to do was a lot of times I'm, you can find me up on my roof with my handheld trying to get more range. And so I was reading articles about, you know, the, the Yagi antennas that you can build. And I was trying to find cheap solutions on a budget. And uh, I saw instructions on how to build a two meter Yagi antenna out of coat hangers. And so I found a two by four and some screws and some coat hangers and put it together and help my, had my buddy help me uh, tune it. But uh, I was trying to reach a repeater out in Tacoma that I could never reach just standing on my roof. And so that's that's why I was building. And it was, it was exciting to start being able to reach out a little bit farther and make contacts with some people. There's so many layers to our hobby. And I found, I don't know about you, but this is a, a question for you. I found that antennas can be addicting. I mean, you know, you yes. get one up and it's like, eh, we need more than one. It, are you finding that to be true? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And and you, you finish building one and you're like, okay, well, I could do this a little bit better or I can get it this much higher or I can throw it up in this tree this much farther. So yeah, it's, it's pretty addicting. So what's going on with you with your rig now? I mean, um, your license, you upgraded from technician. Let's talk a little bit about that process. Was it easy for you to upgrade or did you struggle a little bit? Um, I actually was surprised at how easy it was. With the first technician test, my dad and I were watching a couple YouTube videos. Guys were explaining different parts of the questions. We tried going through the question pool and then we went to that class. It was a day and a half thing where we reviewed it and then we took the test. It was pretty easy. But for general, I downloaded an app on my iPad and just uh, went through the questions and memorized them and studied them. And it was, it was actually easier than I thought it would be. Did your brother also take the technician test? So is it two, two of you and your dad together? Yeah, so uh, my brother-in-law and my brother and then my father, we all went to the class together and took the test and got our technician licenses. So it's really cool because um, since we have the la same last name, my brother has a call sign right before me and my dad has a call sign right after me. So that was really fun. That's really cool. So have you become the more obsessed of the bunch now? Yes, I, I have become the more obsessed one. <laughs> So what's your thing to do? Do you like to get on the air and mess around with the nets or are you practicing code, all of this? What what are you moving toward? So we just had the Mike and Key flea market this weekend and I was able to pick up my first HF rig, uh, bought a used HF rig. So I was, I'm, I'm getting into trying to get on HF. Um, I have to get the proper power supply to transmit, but I cut a 10 meter dipole that I threw up in the trees the other day and was listening to people from Texas and New Hampshire and Guam and that was really exciting but I'm also working on learning Morse code studying that online so I can do that I find that really interesting tell me about the radio that you picked what'd you get I ended up getting a Kenwood TS 440 I was walking around the flea market floor and seeing a bunch of things in my price range and after I walked around and looked at everything, half the things I looked at were gone. <laughs> so the uh, the Kenwood TS440 was, uh, it's a good radio and it was in my price range. And um, the guy that was selling it had recently used it. So I felt fairly confident in purchasing it. I think that's an important point. You mentioned your price range. I mean, here we are, these new guys. I'm just new to HF in February. You know, and uh, and it was such a learning curve for me. I'm lucky I have uh, three great Elmers, you know, to help really pull me along because you kind of understand things a little bit better if somebody's there to teach you. And patience, you talked about that a little bit. But, you know, getting on the radio and having a budget, I had a definite budget of what I wanted to it. get. And I think that's really important because there's guys who've been collecting for 40 years, my Elmers, and, you know, maybe they're in a different tax bracket or you know we can't <laughs> i can't compete with that so luckily there's different levels you know what i mean yeah absolutely yeah and then my 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 budget was the cash in my pocket at the flea market and i was able to find something in my price range which is really great are you going to uh we're going to wrap things up but are you going to study for your extra class license now absolutely yeah i'm going to start studying for that i'm going I'm, my goal is to get morse code under my belt where i can you know do it slowly but i've got all the the letters and numbers down and then i want to go for the extra eventually so i can get a new shorter call sign i'm ready to work you now 
KG7KDD. Thanks for joining us, Mike, the first new ham of the segment. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you. You guys have a good day. I can't believe how good that is. Holy smokes. Let's all applaud uh, Christian for that. Of course, you see, he, he's in the broadcast business. That's what he does every day. Just like Don, these guys are professionals, and we're just a bunch of little amateurs. But, Christian, what a nice job, and I hope all of you enjoyed that. That's just the start. We want more stories from all of you new hams. We want to know how you got here, how you enjoy it, all those good stories. But we got to have pictures. Can't just sit there and talk to a, a camera. We want to know. A little bit behind the scenes, so to speak. So, what a nice, uh, a nice beginning. And uh, Christian tells me he's going to do better. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you got uh, quite a hill to climb if you do better than that. I'm thrilled. Good job, Don. You know what this is? Hmm. Ah, I'm just admiring my clean, close, hairy shave. See, if Don was here, these would be her hands and not mine. Oh, all right. Oh, yes. She loves my hairy shave. And, and, and the lady in your life will love yours as well. And you know, the cool thing about, about Harry's is it's, it's not just for guys. The ladies like the Harry's razors as well. And there's a problem. Just like DX Engineering is fixing the problem of, of uh, expensive ham gear by bringing in a Linko, something for everybody's budget. The same thing with Harry's. Uh, the problem is that you pay too much for overpriced razors. And let's just admit it. Shaving is not fun. It's a chore. You can scrape yourself. You can cut yourself, especially with dull. You wouldn't think that you would cut yourself with a dull blade, but you're more, you're more likely to cut yourself with an old dull blade than you are with a brand new sharp one. It's crazy. And these blades are expensive, about four bucks a pop. Now, a guy who shaves every day, thankfully I don't, mine doesn't grow that fast. A guy that shaves every day spends hundreds of dollars a year just on razors, like your brand name, like Gillette Fusion, for example. And then you go to the store to buy them. Sometimes it's like they want to see your ID. And they've got all that stuff locked up behind plexiglass cabinets. It's like going to the gun store. That's a pain. Well, Harry's is fixing it all. Fixing all of that. High-quality razors, about half the price of those big name brand blades. And here's how. First off, they make their own razors in their very own factory in Germany. They engineer them for sharpness and high performance. They will ship them to you for free to your door. And because they make and ship their own blades, Harry's is an extremely efficient company. That means that they can give you factory direct pricing. Your satisfaction is guaranteed. And in, in, in every kit you get a razor, look at this. So here's, here's, here's one of the razors. This is the one that I use. Now this is a special color because this is the one that they had for their fall deal. Mine is, is, is chrome. But uh, anyway, it's nice. You get a handle. Looks and feels great. This one is metal. They have uh, three razor blades. Comes in a, in a box here. And the foaming shave gel, which is mighty good. Uh, they say don't eat it. I haven't tried, but I'll take their word for it. Um, and also you get, uh, this is neat. I mean, not only are you going to want to use this in the comfort of your own home, but as you go traveling, you want to look your best. Look at this. You get a travel cover that covers, protects, and vents the blade. There are little, little holes there. Keeps it from, uh, you know, getting all yucky and keeps it from coming apart. Great company, Harry's. Now, I'm a confirmed, I'm telling you right now, and I've, I've said this many times, I'm a confirmed electric guy. I love my brawn, but the Harry's is something nice that I do for myself. I don't see it as a chore. I really, I'm not kidding you, I really don't. I, I enjoy shaving with Harry's, and I never did with any other blade. Never do with any other blade. Harry's is so cool. Now, the, the starter Truman set, that's the one that Bob showed you. That's an amazing deal. You got get all that for just 15 bucks. The one that I have, the metal one, is about 10 bucks more. But nonetheless, harrys.com is where you want to go. You get a clean cloth shave. You get a comfortable shave. I love the look and feel of the set. The price is just amazing. And they have an aftershave moisturizer that will protect and hydrate your skin. So I want you to go to harrys.com. Get $5 off your first purchase by typing in Ham Nation. All one word, Ham Nation, H A R R Y S dot com, Harry's dot com. Enter the code Ham Nation at checkout. And Harry's, thank you so much for your support of Ham Nation. We love you. In fact, I, 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 the last Ham Fest I went to, one of my friends came up and he said, Listen, 
I took your advice. So I got the Harry's. I'm not kidding you. I got the Harry's. I love it. And another one of our friends on base says, hey, look, Don's over here. Have you tried the Harry's razor? Seriously. Have, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm just standing there shaking my head like, we've gone from a ham fest to a razor convention. But not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> but we do. We love, our, we love our Harry's. We love our Harry's. We also love our Dale. Our Dale. Dale's not very hairy at all. Hey, and and there he is well? now. How are you, Dale? Hey, Don, Look did, at you. Did, You're green. Did you get... Hey, go ahead. You're green. <laughs> hey, I got the memo this morning. It said uh, this is St. Patrick's Day uh, episode, so we need to be green tonight. So right. we thought we'd contribute to that little part. <laughs> okay, uh, Don. Hey, Don, did you get to operate in the Worldwide DX contest this past weekend? I did. I made two contacts to uh, my friend um, in Croatia. I did not get to talk to him, but I did. Uh, I made uh, a, tw a uh, let's see, uh, 28 megahertz and 21 megahertz. What is that? Uh, 10 and 15 on uh, to uh, Croatia to 9A1A. My friend uh, uh, NF4A was there operating. I did not get to talk to him, but I did. I made two to, uh, to uh, 9A1A in Croatia. I think I worked him too, Don. Hey, that was fantastic. A good weekend. Uh we sort of cherry-picked uh, the contest here looking for stations that uh, confirm via LOTW. And uh, I had about 21 short before I started of the DXCC and hadn't tried to do anything with it in the last year or so. So I thought I'd see if I could uh, rack up some contacts. We managed to work 28 new countries in about, oh, four or five hours on Friday evening or something. Uh, so it was a nice weekend, uh, and they were all LOTW uh, confirmations, hopefully. Uh, they'll be coming in soon, and we'll be able to nail that one down. Wanted to mention something else. Got a new certificate uh, in the uh, mail uh, during the uh, weekend. Uh, <laughs> I almost put this on the wrong side because I was looking at a mirror image before I went on the air, and I had it up on the other side. Uh, this is the certificate I just got in the mail from the Kansas CUSO party. They do a really nice job. So you want to, might want to operate in some of these CUSO parties. They have some nice certificates. I noticed there's four or five or six coming up this weekend. And don't forget the Kansas one uh, in August. Well, that's enough uh, chatter for now. I'll tell you what, let's jump right in. We've got uh, a video celebrating Samuel Morris's birthday but first, you've been real good about sending in shack photos. We uh, received uh, almost three dozen overall. So we've got a fairly lengthy Show Me Your Shack. And let's take a look right now. This is Show Me Your Shack for March 2015. After moving from a house into an apartment, Mike KC0LBY only has a mobile rig, but look at the view. Zerigs and the Linko SR8T running 100 watts into ham sticks for each band. He carries six to seven sticks in the SUV. Chris W7BBQ operates from Glendale, Arizona using this rig, while Tom Tex Ritter WY7KY sent us two shots of his shack in Cheyenne, Wyoming. He uses an ICOM 751 Alpha with an Amatron 811 amplifier. Also has an IC706MK2G and other VHF gear. His antennas include an A4S Yagi at 30 feet, 40 and 75 meter inverted Vs, and a two element 40 meter Yagi at 63 feet. They had a thick frost in Cheyenne when he took the antenna photos. Nico DL7XT has been a Ham Nation fan since episode one. He stumbled across the show a few days after it first aired. Here's his operating position, and here's a close-up view. He uses the Elcraft K-Line for HF and a Kenwood TMD700 for local repeater operation. The DL7XT computers are Mac only. Tom in for HAI also uses a Mac computer system to drive his K3 with an 811 amplifier and a Heathkit HW101 with an ID880. Terry, KN4NQ, sent us two shots with his XYL Angela operating. Angela is totally blind, studying for her extra class license. All of their equipment uses voice synthesis, and she can operate independently. Here's Angela's mobile rig. She operates this one while Terry drives. Richard, KB3ZVH, operates his shack from his home in Erie, Pennsylvania. He's been checking into the Ham Nation 40-meter post show net almost every week lately. 
Ted K7 TRK sent us a picture of his shack in Medford, Oregon. He also has several assistant operators. Here, Cleo gives the operator the once over and appears to be ready to protect that keyboard with her life. In the shot, Ted said Cleo was calling CQ with his vintage Heathkit two meter transceiver circa the early to mid 60s. Dan WA5CYR sent us this picture taken at the shack of Jim Miller WA5TEF in Tupelo, Mississippi. Jim has been a ham for 55 years. He's the Lee County Emergency Communications Manager. Thomas, DG8FBV, who lives near Frankfurt, Germany, has a nice shack. He started as a shortwave listener in 1970, was licensed in 1980, now has 295 DXCC entities confirmed. The Yesu FT1000MP and the FT897D transceivers drive an Amatron AL80B into this antenna array. Well, Kendall, KE0CFZ in Springfield, Missouri, is only 15 years old, so his shack is small at this time. But he plans to have his extra class ticket soon and get on HF if he can find anyone that will give a job to a 15-year-old. Bill, K2WDF, describes his shack as a simple yet useful kitchen countertop shack. He put it together for under $500. The IC745 feeds a ladder line fed 10 meter doublet or a repurposed Archer brand 11 meter 5 8 wave vertical. Fred K6RAU operates from his shack in Merced, California. He's also written and recorded a Morse code course for hams wanting to get on CW. Uh, you can download that course at kj6art.com. Jock in one JI says that his family's grown bigger and his shacks have grown smaller. Says he's now limited to a tiny corner in the bedroom, but he says he's making more contacts and having more fun than he did with his room-sized shack 20 years ago. He loves the NC-303 National Receiver that was part of his first shack. It's also the same receiver that Bob Heil and Joe Walsh donated to the ARRL Vintage Station. Well, Scott W7TY wanted to share an interesting photo of his newly installed HDX 555 tower holding the four element step by our Yagi. His tower permit passed with colors and the rainbow greeted him when he arrived home. Troy sent us this photo of his shack in Moran, Michigan. His station includes a Yesu FTDX 1200 and an Anatron A99 antenna for 10 to 17 meters. He also uses a 72 foot N-fed all band antenna. Bob WB0NPN sent us this photo of the 10 gigahertz EME antenna at the Westchester Amateur Radio Association site located at the decommissioned Voice of America Bethany Relay Station in Ohio. The association operates uh, WC8VOA from that site. Chuck in K9I sent us this photo of his shack in Surprise, Arizona. The rig's an FT100MP with matching Quadra amplifier. Here's Chuck's current HF antenna. He runs a coax and control cable out the door, hooks it up to the tar heel screwdriver HF antenna on his truck. During the CQWWCW contest, he worked 34 of the 40 zones on 10, 15, and 20 meters. And finally, here's a photo of Chris, KF7WRS, still in pajamas just after the 48-hour-long ARRL single sideband DX contest. He operated SOAB slash LP. On the desk is his certificate for placing first in the 2014 single op 10-meter band in Oregon. Well, that's it for March. Make sure to send your shack photos to hamnationvideos at twit.tv. We'll get them into the next Show Me Your Shack episode That'll be in early April. There are some really nice ham shacks out there, and that uh, that's amazing. Thank you for sending them in. Uh, we'll try to have another one next month. Uh, get them into us, and we'll uh, get your shack on the air. I give the new hams that we're featuring now something to look forward to during their amateur radio career. Let's move down to Puerto Rico now, and we've got a video that commemorates 
the 156th anniversary of the birth of Samuel Morris. Of course, he's famous for uh, inventing the Morris Code. NP3QL produced this report. that video with the tripod there in Puerto Rico and thanks a million for the closed caption titles uh, that's the first time we've seen those used on one of the viewer videos and uh, worked out as a very nice idea we have the link to the full six minute 40 second uh, video available on hamnationvideos.info or we will very shortly well, presently, we're out of current viewer videos, so get yours in, and we'll be back in another two weeks and try to get yours on the air for you. That will be on March 25th. Just email the link to your videos to hamnationvideos at twitw.tv. Do shoot for about, uh, oh, three minutes max, if you will, two, two and a half to three minutes, and we'll get you on the air here. Uh, shoot uh, in 720p uh, high definition and Amanda has questions from the chat room next uh, good evening Amanda how many uh, new countries did you work in the ARRL singles uh, sideband DX contest last weekend well good evening Dale you guys see my glasses happy St. Patty's Day by the way <laughs> voice awesome. activated voice That's activated awesome. <laughs> I know. Vox. Vox glasses. Oh, my, oh my gosh. <laughs> Voice activated. Uh, it's kind of bugging me a little bit, but okay. Um, thanks, Dale, uh, for all the... <laughs> I know. <laughs> Don, come on. <sighs> Serious. Okay. Woo. Voice activated. <laughs> okay. So they're obviously made for a club. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I do have serious things here, you guys. Okay, Ken, W1KLG. Um, 
He said, thanks to Gordo's material, I just uh, upgraded to extra last weekend. So congratulations. Yay. And right. um, KD8ZKW, Ken just upgraded to general a couple weeks ago. So awesome. Yay. Congrats. I hope you got on to the DX contest. By the way, I worked about 20 new countries and I'm really hoping they all um, confirm on LOTW. So I had a great time. The The hardest I've ever worked on the DX contest, by the way. So um, with that, I do have some questions. First of all, um, some more Balan questions. Balan. Uh, Bob, I know we've had this question before, but um, somebody, uh, it was KMZ, KM1Z Fran wants to know which Balan for which antenna, the four to one, nine to one, or one to one ratio balance. Well, if it depends on what the antenna is, uh, if you have a 300 ohm twin lead antenna, you need four to one. Uh, if you're going to do the, uh, uh if you're going to do the coax to just a regular dipole, you just need a one-to-one -one balance. Now, most of the balance are one-to-one, -one, but it all depends on what the antenna is. And, uh, so uh, check out what your antenna is, but most of the time it's going to be one-to-one. -one. Okay, good to know. And um, other than that, some more balance questions. Um, client Kill would like to know, whether or not to use insulators to connect to the ballon and should the length of the antenna wire account for the dip that connects to the sides of the ballon? Wouldn't that mess oh, with no, how no. the antenna transmits? Uh -huh. We're talking about this much wire. Don't worry about it. Um, we're, uh, we're not on uh, uh, 400 megs here. No, and you, it, the ballon actually has little connectors on the side of it where the antenna wires solder to, I usually solder them. Those big eyes are just for support for the wire. But there are two places there that actually are the transformer leads and I usually solder mine. Very good. And uh, this one is about being kind of microphone shy. So Don, who is the least shy person that I know, I'm gonna send this out to you. Josh B has been listening to his ham radio buddy work HF. Um, on and off here for a few weeks. And he says his buddy does really great until the time he answers somebody's CQ or somebody answers his CQ, and then he doesn't know what to say. Do you have any ideas of um, what people should talk about when they first start? Wow, that's an interesting question because I, th I think we're all a little bit, can be a little bit intimidated, especially, uh, it kind of depends on the band. 20 meters can be very intimidating. Um, a good way to start would be to um, go to 10 meters and maybe check into the 1010 net. Get yourself a 1010 number and hang out and check into the 1010 net and work and collect some of those 1010 numbers. There's a bunch of really friendly people, and you'll talk to a ton of people on there. Uh, there are a bunch of rag chew nets uh, as well on 75 meters. and that, Some of those guys can be a little clickish sometimes, but uh, uh, Bob's always hanging out on 75. He'll talk to you. He's not clickish at all. Bob's one of the friendlier guys on uh, on on the on ham radio, that's for sure. Um, Forty meters is good for for nets. You get on there and uh, check out the um, uh, a lot of nets for for travelers uh, on forty meters, especially in the morning and in the afternoon. People who are out there running the roads. The um, what's the one I, I that I check into periodically? Um, haven't in a while. Uh, uh, south cars, yeah, south cars. There's south cars for those of us down here along the Gulf Coast, and there's mid cars. For those of uh, up north, 7251 is South Cars. That's a good frequency. You get on there. They're really friendly guys, and they'll talk to everybody. If it's your birthday, they'll sing. Well, they won't sing, but they'll, they'll all say happy birthday to you all at once. It's great. Um, what's another one? Um, the uh, On 20 meters, check out the uh, the Intercon net uh, or the uh, Maritime Mobile Service net on 14300, um, especially on the weekends. A lot of times they'll have, maybe have a little bit more time to chat a little bit. Now, you're not going to get into a long rag chew on, on, on that net for sure. Because it's a it's a uh, it's a traffic and emergency net, but uh, nonetheless, that's a great way to get your get your feet wet. Check into a few nets, uh, and then once you get comfortable with that, then go find yourself a, a clear frequency and start calling CQ and s just like fishing, see what uh, see what nibbles. And right. I think that's great advice. And uh, when you join a net, they teach you how to give a signal report. So that's also yeah. really important. Uh, what do you think, Bob? 
Well, of course. I, I always maintain that you should get on one band and live it for a while. 40 meters yeah. is always good because it's easy to put an antenna up. And uh, you don't have to worry with rotators, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Just put up two 30 good pieces of wire and have fun. But stay on that band a little bit. Mm -hmm. Learn some of the lingo, learn how it rolls and so on. And then you can move uh, up or down from there. But that's always a good place. Hey, while I have it, I want to explain this. We um, Last <laughs> week, if you remember, I played this uh, wonderful piece of audio he got in on uh, 3847 with us and he was mobile and he had an Alinko transceiver and a ham stick from California I mean he had a great signal and then you just saw his station well let me tell you about that name his young baby's name is Colby so he said when he went to get a call he could get a vanity call, and he looked around and found K. Colby, KC0LBY. That's his son's name. Is that cool or what, yes. Amanda? Awesome. It, yes, it is cool. And I met Mike on a late night Triple H net, KC0LBY, and um, I helped him out a little bit. And I felt weird being kind of an Elmer because I didn't think I had been around long enough to do something like that, but I really helped him uh, figure out how to work some of the nets and how to go online and see the check-in list, things like that. So uh, Mike and I are friends on Facebook. We've been friends for four or five years now. I really enjoy his company. Hey, I just had a brilliant idea. A brilliant idea I just had to help someone who may be a little bit Mike shy. Look our call signs up on qrz.com. We all have email addresses. Usually it's our call signs at awrl.net. Send us an email. Ask to set up a schedule. I'm sure any of us would be more than happy to set up a schedule when we have time and talk to you on the radio. We would be more than happy to. Speaking for myself, I, I absolutely would love to do that, especially new hams. I love doing that. So absolutely. fire us up on QRZ, yep. look us up, and send us an email and ask us to talk to you on the radio. We'd be more than happy to. I would love to do the same thing. And I know Val would also love to say hello to some of the fans out there and people looking for help. So, and she's full of information. So you guys uh, definitely take a, take us up on that offer. By the way, we're out of time for tonight. So I know you, um, of course, we always go over. When don't we? We always have so much information. Christian, really great job tonight. Second thing I'd like to say, Bill Pasternak, who doesn't love you? Another great Elmer out there. And he took me under his wing like nothing. So gave me a lot of good advice for the show, no less. So um, thanks a lot. So I'll send it back to you guys. Well, that was a, a wonderful show tonight. I mean, we had so much stuff going on. And I, I appreciate uh, everybody uh, putting in their two cents worth. And uh, some of it was uh, $200 worth. It was really good. <laughs> So uh, I hope that you share this with everybody. I have one question I'm going to answer. Everybody's asking what kind of microphone this is. This is Carrie Underwood's microphone. It's a PR35. The only trick is this one came from the custom shop and it's gold. <laughs> but it's a PR35, which is uh, it's become the vocal microphone of many, many artists, uh, Stevie Wonder and so on, so on, so on. But anyway, there you go. So I answered that. And I think we've got it all under control. Uh, Brian's probably on the floor now because we, oh, man, I, I messed up a couple of uh, times for him. But he pulled it off, and we, uh, we appreciate all your, uh, your work, Brian. The chat room, you guys and gals are great. We'll see you on the nets. Uh, Don, where are you going to be? you have any special place on the nets that you go? Uh, no, not, not usually not the after stuff because my wife – has been working nights lately, and she works nights on Wednesday nights. So when she comes home, she's ready for me to vacate out of this room and go into one where she is, which normally doesn't have a radio. So, so uh, no, I'm not going to do any of the nets tonight. But I'll tell you, you can uh, if you got a D-Star radio like this uh, Icon Mighty 51, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the D-Star net is on uh, Reflector 14 Charlie. And the Echo Link is on the Star Do, Do, Star Do Drop In, which is node 355800. Those are the uh, the digital nets, and of course the HF nets are uh, are elsewhere. And Bob, you probably have the uh, frequencies for those, or uh, uh, can probably get them uh, quicker than I can. Yeah, 
It's real easy. Just move around. You'll find them. Yeah. Uh, 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 3847, you'll find Cheryl there. Uh, yeah. Amanda, you uh, guys and gals on 7268, is that clear tonight? Um, earlier, I saw 7278 mentioned, and um, Jeff and I are actually going to try the D-Star net for the first time tonight. So we got a new DVAP, uh, so wish us luck. Okay, and 14 to, uh, 268 or 286, you have to look around. That's part of ham radio. You'll find them because there'll be a lot of people on it. All right, well, that's it from here. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. We'll see you again next week. And, uh, hey, we'll see you on the air somewhere and see you in Claremore uh, Saturday. So 7-3, everybody, and we'll talk real soon. Bye-bye for now. This is K9EID. Bye-bye.